This is Earth Files, the award-winning news site with the latest updates in science, environment, and real X-Files. Podcasting in-depth reports beyond the 6 o'clock news by Emmy Award-winning journalist Linda Moulton Howe. A sunspot is a region of intense magnetic activity on the sun's surface that is cooler than the rest of the sun. That's why sunspots appear dark. Those dark sunspots appear in cycles of about 11 years. In between spots on the sun are quiet times called solar minimums. The last solar cycle minimum, number 23, began in May 1996. The next solar cycle, number 24, was expected to start sometime in 2007 with a new crop of sunspots. But it is now April 2009, and this is the most spotless sun in a century. Scientists did not start numbering solar cycles until 1755, after a mini-ice age in Europe that was linked to a nearly spotless sun for 70 years, a period referred to as the Maunder Minimum. The Maunder Minimum, named after solar physicist Edward Maunder, was a 70-year-long period, roughly from 1645 to 1715, when sunspots became exceedingly rare on the sun. During one 30-year period within the Maunder Minimum, astronomers observed only about 50 sunspots, compared to 40,000 to 50,000 sunspots in modern times. A patch of magnetism on the sun was declared by NASA to be the first official sunspot of the new solar cycle 24. The spot was in a high latitude on the sun with reverse polarity from the previous solar cycle 23. With that discovery, solar scientists expected 2008 would bring more sunspots as the new solar cycle developed intensity toward solar maximum expected in 2011 to 2012. But out of 365 days in 2008, 266 were without sunspots. So far in 2009, January had 25 sunspot-free days, February had 23 sunspot-free days, and March had 28 sunspot-free days. Solar cycle 23 began in a May 1996 minimum, so by April 2009, it has been 13 years between minimums and still no increasing sunspots. The last time a solar cycle has gone 13 years between minimums was solar cycle 15 in 1902 to 1913. Recently, I talked about the unusual 13 years between minimums in solar cycles 23 and 24 with John Davis, Ph.D., manager of the Space Science Office at NASA's Marshall Space Flight Center in Huntsville, Alabama. Dr. Davis had planned to launch an instrument in September 2008 to measure the sun's magnetic fields but he needs active sunspots in order to have fields to measure. So now he and his fellow scientists are still waiting to launch. Frustrated, Dr. Davis now wonders if there will even be sunspots this summer of 2009. Six months ago, my prediction was that it would have turned up by now because I was comparing it to other past cycles. And so I was saying by April that we would have substantial activity. Which is now, April 2009. Yes, I know. (laughs) And I had, but now I postponed it again now to July. But I don't know if that's going to be any better. My guess is that it could go on, as I said, for quite a long time, maybe another 12 months. Although within that 12 months, I would not be at all surprised to see one or two active rotations, and then it will drop back down again. That's what has happened in the past, but that's no guarantee that that's what's going to happen in the future. And what would you, in an educated guess, expect from the maximum? When would you expect us to maybe have X-40 flares and for about how long? Well, it would go on the same 11-year cycle. So that wouldn't change. The maximum, if it comes, it may be, I mean, I cannot tell you whether it's going to be a large cycle or a small cycle. The suggestion is that it probably will be a fairly small cycle. And that'll be three or four years from now. 
If it doesn't do that, I don't know what it's doing. <laughs> well, <laughs> let me ask it this way. Originally, in my very first interviews with other solar physicists, the solar max in solar cycle 24 was expected to peak in 2011 to 2012. Is that still on track? Yeah, that still could be very well be on track, except it's un- probably unlikely that it's going to be as high as we predicted before. It may be at the low end of the scale, not as intense. But uh, as soon as you say something, the, you know, the sun knows what it's going to do, and it doesn't tell us. <laughs> My guess is, uh, if I was going to put money on it, right? I would say that the next two solar cycles are actually going to be quite small. As I pointed out before, the next minimum will also be long. But that's because that's what it has done twice in the past. Okay. Four of the last Five cycles have been very big cycles, and that's somewhat unusual. And is the bottom line here that the sun is still baffling even to our world's best solar physicists? (laughs) It's baffling to me. (laughs) I I can't speak to the world's best solar physicists, but uh, we can only say the consensus opinion did not expect this. Astrophysicist Mark Meesh Ph.D. and staff scientist at the High Altitude Observatory in the National Center for Atmospheric Research in Boulder, Colorado, studies the solar dynamo, which is how the sun generates the magnetic fields that make sunspots. He also wonders what's going on inside the sun and how much longer it will be before sunspots emerge again. It's a fascinating time. It's the quietest sun in a century since the solar minimum of 1913. And it's still possible the next cycle might be large. It's still possible that coming off a deep minimum, the next cycle might be stronger than the previous one. But the relatively long minimum here, it wasn't predicted, but it's not completely unprecedented. Meaning that by 2011 to 2012 at solar max in solar cycle 24, that we still could have strong X40 flares in a strong solar max, even with this quiet sun in the beginning? Yes, that's possible. Different models say different things. So according to some models, a deep solar minimum would imply that the upcoming maximum will be weaker than usual as well. But uh, other models say differently. It could go either way. What does your work in studying the sun indicate to you? Well, I wouldn't want to go on the record with a prediction. (laughs) My work tends to indicate that uh, that it's largely random. I study how stars build magnetic fields. The sun and uh, and other stars we see in the galaxy, there's many stars that exhibit magnetic activity like the sun. And the one thing that they all have in common is what we call convection. In the outer part of these stars, we know convection from daily experience. Warm air rises, cooler air sinks. And if you heat a fluid from below, like in the sun, so energy is released by nuclear reactions in the core. And that heats the fluid from below, so you have overturning motions. And these fluid motions are what generate magnetic fields. That constant churning motion inside the sun is what builds magnetic fields. The energy of motion of the fluids is converted into magnetic energy, and that's how. And the turbulent nature of those fluids, they're very chaotic. So that's what gives you the, uh, the, the chaotic part of the sun. That's why each solar cycle is not the same as the last, because there's a certain random element. And in the context of what you study, a sunspot is what? A sunspot is a manifestation of the magnetic field in the in the deep interior of the sun. In fact, it was a century ago. It's the 100th anniversary of when the American astronomer George Ellery Hale first detected magnetic fields on the sun, and it was in sunspots. That was in 1908 to 1909. And so he was the first to show that sunspots are a magnetic phenomenon. They come from magnetic fields. And we now think that those magnetic fields originate deep in the interior of the sun, and then they rise through something that we call magnetic buoyancy. There's tubes of magnetism that are less dense than their surroundings, and they rise like a hot air balloon and then poke out the surface of the sun. 
and that's what we think a sunspot is. There are ways to probe the magnetism below the surface of the sun. So when the sun is going 268 days with no sunspots, what does that say to you about what is happening deep inside of the sun? It says that there's no strong enough fields to become buoyant like hot air balloons. So the sun isn't generating these strong magnetic concentrations of magnetic field. But that doesn't mean solar magnetism has ceased. Just like the Earth has a magnetic field around it, the sun has a magnetic field around it. It's pushed out by the solar wind and envelops the whole solar system. And there are cosmic rays, are particles that are generated by supernovae and other things in the galaxy. But the sun has a, a magnetic cage around all the planets and deflects those cosmic rays. So at times when the magnetic activity of the sun is small, more cosmic rays get in. And when magnetic activity is high, less cosmic rays get in. That comes to the Earth, and they create isotopes in certain elements like beryllium and carbon. And you can measure that back 10,000 years, and beryllium is in ice cores in Greenland and Antarctica. And carbon is contained in tree rings if you find an old tree. So by looking at those isotopes, we can trace things back a long time. And that tells us that the solar cycle was still going on in the modern minimum. So the solar cycle, the sun's protective bubble around all the planets was going up and down every 11 years just like it is now. But yet there were no sunspots. So it's a fascinating puzzle. Some models say that sunspots are an integral part of why the 11-year cycle can't proceed without sunspots. But these isotope data during the modern minimum suggest that might not be the case. So us having a prolonged minimum now is exciting from a scientific point of view. And that we still could have a large solar max out of this very long, quiet sun. Yeah, there are times in, in history, you, you can go back to uh, times when we've had prolonged minima and the maximum that comes out is relatively strong. Is there any potential danger to Earth surface life of the sun going for an indefinite period of time without sunspots? Uh, not, not really. No, like I said, there is still solar magnetism. Uh, we call the uh, magnetic field that surrounds the Earth makes a protective bubble that we call the magnetosphere. The similar protective bubble around the sun and all the planets is called the heliosphere. There's still solar magnetism permeating the heliosphere even during the modern minimum and even during extended minima. So if there were no sunspots for 70 years, there would still be a heliosphere. But it does shrink. Yeah, the amount of magnetism in the heliosphere does go down when solar activity goes down, lets more cosmic rays in. And what is the danger of more cosmic rays coming to the Earth? Not significant from a health perspective. The biggest impact that solar activity has is at times of strong solar activity. that You wouldn't want to take a transpolar flight. For instance, an airline flight from New York City to Beijing, China, they go at pretty high latitudes. And if there's a lot of magnetic activity on the sun, it sends out particles in the solar wind, and those get funneled toward the poles by Earth's magnetic field. And that's what causes aurora. Aurora are nice to look at when you're in the safetyness of standing on the Earth's surface. But if you're in a plane in the stratosphere, you can get a significant dose of radiation if you fly through an aurora. What about the guys that are up on the International Space Station? Yeah, that's right. The space station itself is within the magnetosphere. It's within Earth's protective bubble. And its orbit is, is more toward the equator. It's more low latitudes. So actually, astronauts on the International Space Station would get less radiation than a high-altitude flight over the poles. However, if you went to the moon, that would be a different story. If, if you went outside the magnetosphere, astronauts on a deep space mission to the moon or Mars would certainly get a lot of solar radiation if, if there was a lot of magnetic activity. If we kick into a strong maximum, then it could become a threat again. But what, what usually happens is um, it's more of an economic issue than a health issue because if there is a significant threat of increased radiation, what the planes will do is fly lower. And flying lower means more atmospheric drag, which means more fuel and possibly multiple stops. 
shorter flights. So it can cost the airlines money. The high solar activity can disable satellites. So uh, telecommunications satellites in particular can be disabled. So telecommunication companies would have to repair them or launch new ones. And also high solar activity can disrupt power grids on the ground. Do you have a sense yourself, based on what you study, of when you would expect to start seeing a lot of sunspots again? From what I study, I study turbulent fluids, and turbulence is inherently random and unpredictable. So my own experience says it's unwise to make (laughs) forecasts of of what a chaotic system is going to do. Then why is there an 11 and 22 year cycle in the sun at all? That is an excellent question, yes. There are random processes uh, superposed on top of more ordered processes, and every star has a mixture of those. Our sun is particularly regular compared to other stars. You can look at other stars, and uh, some of them have activity cycles like the sun. Some of them are just completely chaotic, and they don't have any, any rhyme or reason on what their magnetic activity is doing. Well, what produces the cycle in our sun? That is a question that people have been asking since for 200 years. (laughs) And nobody knows. Well, there are certainly models. And it has to do with how the sun is stretched out. It has to do with uh, differential rotation. The sun spins faster at its equator than at its poles. That tends to stretch out magnetic fields. If you have a magnetic field line that goes from the equator to the pole but the equator spins around faster than the pole, that magnetic field line gets stretched out into an east-west direction, and it gets stronger and stronger. How does the sun go faster at the equator than the poles? That's another question that people have been working on for centuries, but it has to do, again, with this convection. As these motions go up and down and overturn, they transport heat from the interior to the surface to make the sun shine, They create magnetic fields, and they also redistribute angular momentum. So the way in which they redistribute angular momentum in a spinning star makes the equator spin faster than the poles. And why is it that the interior of the sun is so much hotter than the surface? The interior of the sun is hotter than the surface. It's the nature of why a star is stable, that gravity pushes in but you have to have an outward gradient of pressure. Pressure has to push out to balance gravity. So the center of the star has to be have a higher pressure than the surface, or it'll implode. Right now, anything could happen with the sun, including 70 years of another monitor minimum? Yeah, that's possible. I think it's unlikely, but it's possible. But why do you say it's unlikely? Because the modulation, I think, is random. The modern minimum was the only extended period like that in the last 400 years. The most exciting part of this for me is this is the deepest solar minimum of the space age. Since we have instruments to really monitor the sun and space weather and the whole magnetism in the heliosphere and how the sun interacts with the planets, we have more instruments now, telescopes, both in space and on the ground, monitoring this than ever before. And this minimum will tell us a lot about the nature of how the sun generates magnetic fields and about how those magnetic fields shape the solar corona and the heliosphere and how solar activity impacts the planets. And that even out of a long minimum like this one, we still could have X40 flares as we get to 2011 to 2012? It's possible, yes. Thanks for listening to this Earth Files podcast from the edges of science, environment, and real X-Files. Go to www.earthfiles.com to see more than a thousand Earth Files reports with photographs, drawings, and documents. And visit Earth Files every day, every week for new reports and new podcasts. That's www.earthfiles.com. 